Great. Well, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome as the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston presents Vladimir Karamuza uh, for our riveting discussion on the military policy of Russia and the possible war against Ukraine and I'm sure a few other little secrets. Hello, my name is Marianne Baldonado, and whether you're joining us here this evening in person or virtually from home, uh, welcome. It's nice to see so many of our council cabinet members, as well as friends of the Houston Public Media. There are many Houston Public Media people here tonight. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, also, I know that we have uh, possibly some first timers. Do we have any first timers in, in the room? First timers. Okay, first two people I saw these you guys. You guys get a copy of David Rubenstein's book as our as our gift to you. So come pick it up at the very um, front on your way out. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you'll join us for other events in the future. Um, I hope all of you also will stay after to join us for our wine reception following the program. It's going to be in the back. And a special thanks to Martha Box and Marvin. Thank you so much for hosting us and helping us support tonight's program. Now, I want to make sure that everybody in calendar, calendar. Great, good. Well, it's nice to get back to more routine things, and calendars are one of those things we want to make sure that you keep handy. We update those routinely as new programs come on. But I wanted to highlight just a few that I'm sure you're not going to want to miss. Um, next Wednesday, we have a European ambassador's lunch. It's going to include the ambassadors of Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic, as well as next Thursday, we'll be back here with Pulitzer Prize winning author Toby Warwick, and he's going to speak on Syria and the threat of terrorist chemical weaponry. So make sure you sign up for both of those as well. There's so many more things going on here in Central Houston and throughout our community. Um, let's say I want to remind everybody that we have a number of new travel destinations. We are all eager to get out of town. I don't know if you are as much as I am, but I am. And we've added some new destinations to our roster. Those include Australia, New Zealand, Paris, France, which I'm excited to get back to you, and an exclusive behind the scenes tour inside Washington, D.C. So you can learn more or sign up for our info sessions at wachouston.org. Now I want to mention that for all high school students, we're expecting a, a good number of high school students. We have just opened registration for Academic World Quest, and this is a fun annual international competition, and the winning team gets to go to Washington, D.C. on us. So you'll want to make sure you and your school are registered to attend that. And speaking of high school students, um, it's great to have, again, some of you here tonight with us, and thank you for coming. Uh, if you are a high school student and joining us here this evening, I want you to take home a book of this amazing documentary put on by the former uh, White House correspondent uh, under the Trump administration, Sean Spicer. So make sure you pick those up on the way out as well. It's your opportunity to get a good read on us. Now, um, let me make sure I can to get to the rest of my notes because they're oh so important. You won't miss them. Uh, also, starting again is this April is the uh, Council's Global Affairs and U.S. Foreign Policy Institute. And whether you're an international affairs junkie, you're in business, you're a lay person. I just want to learn more about what's happening in China, the Middle East, what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, and just kind of have a full understanding of that. We're going to be starting that in April. It's generally a seven-week program, just one short evening or night, and we'll meet some like-minded people and have a great time. We usually host those at the council's offices. And lastly, joining us, I think we might have some of our global young professionals committee members. Is anybody here from our Global Young Professionals Program Committee. Yes, great. Thank you for joining us. We're so pleased that you could come tonight. They're going to help us uh, move our Young Professionals Program uh, forward and make it bigger and broader as much as we can. So uh, thank you all again for joining us. Now it is my pleasure to introduce John Jopakor. He is my colleague who is in charge of the Global Young Professionals. So please join me in welcoming 
Ladies and gentlemen, um, now on to our speaker for tonight. Vladimir Karamurza is a Russian politician, author, and historian. A longtime colleague of the assassinated opposition leader Boris Nemtsov, he was a candidate for the Russian parliament and served as deputy leader of the People's Freedom Party. Leading diplomatic, diplomatic efforts on behalf of the opposition, Karamurza played a key role in the adoption of, a targeted, of the targeted uh, Magnitsky Act uh, sanctions on human on Russian human rights violators in the United States, European Union, Canada, and Great Britain. U.S. Senator John McCain called him one of the most passionate and effective advocates for the passage for the passage of the uh, Magnitsky Act. Twice in 2015 and 2017, Howard Mosher was poisoned and left in a coma. Subsequent media investigations identified officers of Russia's Federal Security Service were behind the poison. He is a contributing writer at the Washington Post and hosts a weekly show on Echo of Moscow Radio. Karen Murza has previously worked for the BBC, RTVI, and Comerset. He has directed three documentary films and is author of Reform or Revolution. Karen Murza is the founding chairman of the uh, Nemtsov Foundation and served as vice president at Open Russia and the Free Russia Foundation. Both organizations were designated as undesirable uh, by Vladimir Putin's government. Karen Murza is a recipient of several awards, including the Sakharov Prize for Journalism as an Act of Conscience, the Magnitsky Human Rights Award, and the Geneva Summit Courage Award. Joining him in conversation this evening will be the Council's Director of Programs, Ronan L. So please join them for a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Jahan and Marianne and Amaji, and thank you all so much for coming here tonight. Uh, we ended up with a great uh, for a lot of people. I think getting used to coming back to events in person. Um, I'm sorry, next time we'll definitely have enough seats. Um, so thank you all for, for standing in the back. And everyone watching at home or, or the office, if you're still there, thank you all for joining us. Uh, and Vladimir, I don't think I even mentioned it to you, but thank you for coming. Uh, Vladimir has been on my radar, I think, for three or four years. You can ask my colleagues, and trying to figure out a way to, to get him and when he might be uh, you know, in the U.S., and I'm so delighted to have you here in person. There's an awful lot to talk about. I think we'll focus mostly upon kind of current modern-day Russia, especially, say, what's happening in Ukraine right now. But uh, Jahan went through uh, your incredible biography, your courageous biography, uh, been poisoned twice, and you're still fighting for Russia, you still go back to Russia. Um, can you just tell us briefly about your own involvement? Uh, your, your father was a journalist, he was a critic of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Times. Um, it's in your blood, you've been doing it since a young age. Could you maybe briefly give us an idea of, of how it is you got so passionately involved in politics really as, as a teenager, and, and how and why you're still doing it today? Oh, well, thank you so much, Ron, first of all, and thank you to the World Affairs Council Greater Houston for the invitation. I'm honored and delighted to be uh, uh, with you here tonight for this conversation. Um, and to, to your question, uh, Ron, I think I could sort of say many different things. The family history, I think there were several generations back, this involvement sort of journalism, history, politics, law, and so on. Um, so I guess genes might have something to do with it, but I think. Uh, most importantly, I would say that, in a way, my generation was inevitably going to be politicized in Russia. Because to me, uh, I was born in 1981, so to me, the first conscious political memory uh, was uh, that of the Russian Democratic Revolution of August 1991, the three days that ended the Soviet regime. And um, there are few things as powerful as when you see a revolution unfolding in front of your eyes, especially of the kind that we witnessed uh, in Russia uh, that August. Um, as you know, of course, that uh, began as a hardline coup d'etat uh, by the top leadership of the Communist Party and the KGB and the Soviet military and other power structures. 
Um, and the intention was to, to try to end all those policies of past and to destroy kind of, sort of half hearted reforms that Gorbachev was conducting and to go back to the uh, bad old ways uh, of real Soviet totalitarianism. And the people who were behind that coup, the top leaders of the Soviet state, had absolutely everything at their disposal, or at least so it seemed. They had the party apparatus, the government machinery, the uh, television networks, radio stations, the army, the police, the mighty machine of repression that was the Soviet KGB. Uh, and of course, they had the tanks which they sent into the streets of Moscow, the very same tanks that had once uh, rolled the streets of Budapest, Prague, Vilnius. Uh, they came to us in August 1991. And um, Russian citizens, Moscovites, who refused to accept that coup attempt, who refused to accept a return to the bad old totalitarian ways, were not armed with anything except their own dignity and their determination to defend their rights and their freedoms. And so they went into the streets in thousands and tens of thousands, then eventually hundreds of thousands, and literally stood in front of the tanks. And then the tanks stopped and turned away. And to me, I think like this certainly leaves an impression. Uh, and to me, the main lesson of those days, uh, and a lesson that still endures, and a lesson that sort of serves as an important source of moral support as, as we stand up against another authoritarian system in Russia today, the main lesson is that however strong the prevailing forces, however strong a dictation, however strong an authoritarian system, when enough people are willing to stand up for what they believe in, all that seeming strength on the other side becomes powerless. And I've seen that happen with my own eyes, even in my own country. And so this being my first conscious political memory was difficult not to <laughs> become involved in. and interested in politics. And this is sort of the, the general, uh, I guess, the general explanation of things. But then, of course, you know, apart from being a politician and in my former life a journalist, I'm also a historian by education. I'm, I'm a big believer in the role of uh, personalities in history. Uh, with, with, we see that, that important terms uh, in world history, personalities can play an important role, but it's not just in world history, it's also in influencing other individuals. And to me, apart from this general motivation and general interest, and of course also the fact that uh, I did grow up during the 1990s, and it was a rare period in Russia, that neither the generations before, nor now the young generation that has grown up under Putin has witnessed, you know, uh, frankly, um, there are very few periods, unfortunately, of genuine political liberty in Russia. And the 90s were such a period. It was a period of time when we had independent television, free elections, a pluralistic parliament. All these things are unthinkable in Russia. They, they were all uh, a reality when I was growing up. So again, that, that's another influence. But back to the role of personality. Um, at the end of uh, the 90s, I came to work uh, for a man named Boris Nemtsov. Uh, a name that is familiar to many of you in the audience, because this is probably mentioned to me on the way here. Uh, there was a film screening about Boris Nemtsov here at this council a couple of years ago, right, three or four years ago. Uh, Boris Nemtsov, of course, was somebody who had in many ways symbolized this short-lived period of hope for democracy uh, in Russia in the 1990s. He was uh, a young parliamentarian, successful regional governor uh, in Nizhny Novgorod, who very quickly turned um, uh, that province that used to be a sort of a Soviet military industrial backwater in communist times, a close city before us, is what Sakharov was sent into exile, very quickly turned it into a hub of um, free market and democratic reforms. Uh, he became deputy prime minister under President Boris Yeltsin and was widely viewed as the most likely uh, person to succeed Yeltsin's president, as the most viable presidential candidate. Uh, of course, we know uh, history shows otherwise, as they say. And when uh, Mr. Putin came to power and began to transform Russia from the imperfect democracy we had in the 90s to the perfect authoritarian state we have today, uh, many people accepted the new rules. It was obviously easier and less dangerous and less risky things to do. Decided to play by the new rules and either just stay quiet or even join the ranks of the new regime. Boris Nemtsov was not like that. He was, for him, the only purpose of being in politics was to, to stand up for principles. Um, and he would always, uh, speak his mind. He would always do what he believed in. He would always say what he believed. He would always keep his promises. It was a real rarity in politics, breaking stereotypes in many ways. In many ways, and so under Putin, uh, Boris Nemtsov emerged very quickly as the most prominent, the most effective, 
the most clear voice in opposition to everything that the Putin regime has come to represent the corruption, the autocracy, the abuses that we all see today. Uh, and he was able to organize mass rallies against the regime, he was able to successfully advocate for those targeted sanctions that were mentioned in the introduction, he was able to win elections, which for an opposition and authoritarian state should be impossible, but he, he managed to do this. Uh, and so at the end of February of 2015, coming up to the seventh anniversary, uh, Boris Nemtsov was uh, gunned down literally in front of the Kremlin walls in Moscow. It was the most brazen, the most high profile political assassination in the modern history of Russia. It was the only way they could silence him. And, um, you know, personal inspiration can be important too. And so I, I worked for Boris, with Boris Nemtsov for more than 15 years from the late 90s and until that uh, wretched evening uh, in central Moscow. And um, so I guess that's that's not an answer to your question. It's, uh, it's it's personal influences that that can be as important as sort of the general historical era we live in. But I think that the primary motivation now is how could we not be involved in this? Almost that sort of turn your question uh, on its head because well I can tell you certainly for myself I would feel that if I just stood idly by and watch what was happening to my country, what the Putin regime is doing to my country, and did nothing about it, well, then that would make me complicit as well. And this is not acceptable. You have to do something about it if you disagree with something. So by now, uh, I don't even know if we can call it politics or political work, because you know, politics is what you have in this country. When you have elections, when you have campaigns, when you have political debates, we don't have any of that. And, and it's, you know, it's debatable even with the term Opposition, you described me as an opposition politician in the game, which of course I am, and it would be a normal political system. But it's, uh, you know, maybe uh, the term dissident in our context in Russia today would, would be more applicable. So it's not so much maybe even a political work as much as it's just not being able to stand out divine and remain silent in the face of Mr. Putin is doing and everything that's happening in the country. Well, and thank you for what you are doing. Um, you, you touched upon it, Jahan mentioned it in your bio. Um, <clears throat> A lot of people maybe I don't want to take you through difficult times that I'm sure you've gone through many times before, but a lot of people if they've been poisoned once, uh, and the doctor's told the wife he has about a five percent chance of living, he's in a coma and he makes it, and then he's poisoned a second time years later, again in the coma in the hospital, very small chance of making it. Um they would have given up, they would have left Russia, they would have, you know, kind of just accepted a, a reasonable life exile. I mean, you obviously know the dire threats potentially to your life, but why is it that to you it's so important to keep pushing? Um, actually, tomorrow, February 11th, uh, will be exactly one year since that investigation came out. Uh, it was referenced at the beginning. It's uh, um, a series of media investigations by the Berlin Cabinet Group, uh, Insider, Der Spiegel, the German magazine, and a few other media outlets that have identified um, this. Squadron of FSB officers, officers of Russia's Federal Security Service, um, whose task it is to physically eliminate opponents of the Putin regime uh, by the use of the prohibited chemical weapons. These are the people who poison Alexei Navalny, these are the people who poison uh, Dmitry Bikov, a prominent satirical writer. Uh, these are the people who poison me, these are the people who poison a whole series of other uh, mostly regional opposition activists in this sort of brutal investigative journalism. So last year, and so tomorrow will be exactly uh, one year that, since I first saw the faces of the four people who tried to kill me. And I have to say, you know, it's one thing to know, so sort of, theoretically, that somebody's trying to kill you, when they actually show you the faces and the names, I, I have no words to, to describe that emotion. Um, and I think it's actually just bears maybe sometimes taking a step back and saying out loud, but because it's you know it's a reality to live with it, you're sort of used to it and accustomed to it. Although that's something that should never be used to or accustomed to. But, uh, you know, in a European country in the 21st century, there is a professional squad of assassins in the employment of a state whose job it is to physically eliminate political opponents. No, this is a reality in Russia. Um, to your question, um, well, to be honest, I didn't even have uh, a second thought or, or, or that was never a question of whether or not to, to go back. Most times, as soon as I was physically able to, to stand and walk again, uh, and I did medical rehabilitation abroad, just as Alexei Biden, he's poisoned 
he was in Germany. I was I was actually here in the US or my Korea. Um, I just went straight back home to Russia and, and resume uh, my work because I think the biggest gift those of us who are in opposition to Putin's dictatorship could give to the Kremlin would be to give up and run. This is what they want from us. You cannot be a politician and not be in the country. You know, when, when Alexei Navalny woke up from his coma and said, the first thing he said, as soon as he was able to speak again, was that he uh, was going to go back and return to Russia as soon as he was able to. I was literally inundated by calls from, from journalists asking me to comment on this sensation, as they put it, to which I responded that not only don't I see any kind of sensation, I don't see any use. You know, of course, he's going to go back. He's a Russian politician. A Russian politician has to be in Russia. You cannot do politics from outside. You lose all moral credibility. Um, and so he would be a biggest gift to Mr. Putin and his friends if we were to leave it. We're not having a giving them gifts. And just, uh, you know, obviously, probably not just in Russia, but many in the West, uh, including the United States, when Putin first came to power, there were, there were thoughts and hopes that maybe he could be, say, a reformer, but get the country back together. After the chaos, kind of uh, you know, of, of of the nineties, you know, Nelson obviously had his enormous number of problems himself, um, but it's devolved into in a lot of ways a more sinister regime than say the Soviet Union or you know communist China. That it's it's a soft authoritarianism, this quasi democracy where you might have an election, and that actual election, the votes might be relatively accurate, but it's everything outside of it. It's controlling the media. It's forbidding. Uh, about opposition figures from running. Um, can you help people understand the, um, I suppose, political status in Russia that there is an opposition? In some ways, a, a degree of opposition by minority parties is encouraged uh, by the Kremlin. It, it gives a semblance of uh, democracy to the country. But maybe explain to people the difference between, you know, some people call it the uh, systemic parties. Those that are minority parties, say from the far left, the communists are still running on the far right, and nationalist parties, a lot of times they actually are supportive of Putin. Uh, and then the realistic opposition, the ones who are not in Parliament, who are not in Tuma, the ones like yourself, like Navalny, like Nepsov, um, what does the non systemic political figures face? What do you face, especially this last year, with um, even more restrictions and bannings of, of a lot of political organizations? Well, when uh, Mr. Putin was coming to power more than two decades ago, there were some uh, wishful thinkers uh, in the West, among the political commentators, analysts, and so on, who tried to look for some good signs of him. This always happens. Every time there's a new Kremlin leader, they get those Western criminologists trying to say, oh, there's, you know, there's some good in there. Uh, probably most famous or infamous, I should say, when Yuri Andropov became Soviet sort of leader in the early 80s. Somebody who had been head of the KGB for many years, somebody who symbolized the worst of the worst of the post Stalin political repression in the Soviet Union, there were still people in the West who found good things to say about him. You know, there were rumors that he secretly listened to jazz or that he liked French cognac or whatever, as if that had anything to do with what he actually did. Um, and so when Putin came to power, I remember this one of the most sort of um, put forward arguments from those wishful thinkers was that, oh, but you know, he spent so many years living in Germany. So surely he must have been influenced by you know Western lifestyle and something he must have rubbed off. And, and that's absolutely correct, except of course that it was the wrong German. He lived in the so-called German Democratic Republic, the DDR, East the German state. And in fact, the political system that Mr. Putin has built in Russia today strikingly resembles the political system of the German Democratic Republic, East Germany, uh, back in the communist days. Because unlike the Soviet Union, uh, or like, say, communist China today. Uh, the GDR was never a one-party state, not officially. If you look to the East German legislature, there were several quote-unquote parties represented. There were the Christian Democrats, which actually still exist in Germany today. There was the Liberal Party, there was the Peasant Party, something else. Uh, except, of course, it was all a sham. And on every question, these so-called alternative parties voted unanimously in support of the, uh, with very, very few exceptions, support of the ruling uh, system. This is exactly what we have uh, in Russia today. If you look at our so-called parliament, uh, the State Duma, uh, you will see it now includes five, actually, not even four, but five different political parties. But in, on every question that matters to the Kremlin, they vote unanimously in support. This is what happened with the law on foreign agents. This is what happened with uh, uh, 
adoption ban, uh, the ban of uh, US citizens adopted orphan Russian children 10 years ago. This is what happened in the Iraq on the annexation of Crimea in 2014, and so on and so on. Every important question, these people come and, and, uh, and vote unanimously in favor of the government. So, so that's I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because it's important to sort of dispense from our pretense. There is no opposition on the official level. There are no elections in Russia. The last time we had anything approaching a free and fair election uh, in my country was back in 1999 2000. It's not my opinion, it's uh, the conclusion of the uh, monitoring missions from the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, and the Council of Europe, so the two watchdogs for uh, elections on the European continent that, um, that usually send monitoring missions. The last time, so the gold standard of election observation almost, the last time that these two organizations assessed a national Russian election to have been largely free and fair and democratic was back in 1999 for the parliament and 2004 the presidency. We have a whole generation in Russia grow up without seeing a real election not once. Um, and because there are many different tricks the regime uses to um, to ensure the quote unquote correct results, you know, the traditional ballot stuffing, busting people around, the right to tallies, and so on. Uh, you know, there's a new know how that was uh, tried out in 2021. Last, last September, we had so called parliamentary elections, uh, which is the uh, so called electronic voting, where you literally you don't need to do the traditional voting, where you can just make up tabs and electronic votes. Uh, and you know, just add them to the tiny and complete the results that you don't want. But you know, we could, we could talk about this for a long time, but most importantly, and I guess we could just end that conversation there, genuine opponents of the regime are simply not allowed on the ballot. It's not difficult to win an election, your opponents are not on the ballot, to say the obvious. And this is what's been happening in Russia for years and years. You know, the two strongest and most prominent political opponents of the Putin regime are Boris Nemtsov and Alexei Navalny. One has been murdered, and the other one who tried to murder, and then that didn't succeed. He's now in prison, and next week you know, there's another sham trial being really against him to have several more years to his sentence. So the real opposition in Russia, and again, I want to go back to the point that it's debatable of whether we can even use the term opposition when it comes to uh, modern Russia under Putin, because opposition is a term that comes from normal free political systems. You know, members of the opposition say, in legislatures, they sit in television studios, they take part in elections. In our country, members of leaders of the opposition uh, are either killed, exiled, or imprisoned. And so I think maybe again, the term dissidents, uh, you know, echoing back to what was happening in the Soviet times, uh, is a much more appropriate term to describe those of us who are standing against the uh, regime of this group. Um, yeah, much like Chavez uh, for basically 10, the first 10 years Chavez was in power in Venezuela, the first 10 years Putin was in power in Venezuela, he had just the blind good luck of, of continually rising oil prices, which helps uh, correct a lot of the economic and budgetary failings of the 90s and Nelson. Um, you know, we constantly hear that Putin is a, a long-term visionary, he's, a, he's, a, he's playing chess while the West is playing checkers, but you know, in reality, you look at where Russia is now, 22 years into his rule, uh, estimates over 5 million Russians have left the country. Many of those, some of the best educated, most skilled Russians. The birth rates in Russia for the last 10 plus years are below replacement levels. Um, you look at the, the budgets, uh, the, the budget, typical budget for the last 10 years in Russia, the federal budget's revenue will rise upon 40% from oil and gas revenues. And, and you know, more than that in terms of its tax base. So there are actually percentages that are higher and worse than the budget during the Soviet Union. What do you think will happen in Russia if we go through a prolonged period of years of low oil and gas prices, especially oil prices? Uh, and on top of that, perhaps we have truly significant sanctions put in place. Do you think people will take to the streets? Um, so first of all, you, several times you've contrasted the situation in the 90s with the situation under Putin. Let's not forget, of course, President Yeltsin in the 90s inherited a collapsed empire, a collapsed totalitarian planned economy. Uh, he inherited the legacy of decades of totalitarian rule and socialist planned economic system. Uh, you know, when you have that, it's, well, you're not going to have a successful economy. So a lot of this blame uh, that has been shifted on, on the democratic government uh, in the 90s is frankly a product of Putin's propaganda mission. So I think it's important not to just blindly repeat that. I, I lived through the 90s in Russia. It was a very difficult time. There were some really economic hardships. There were very real 
and great social problems and difficulties. There's a lot of bad things happening. But also in the 90s, we had genuine political freedom. We had democratic elections. We had independent media. We had an opening to the world, the likes of, the likes of which we hadn't seen probably for a century before that. So it was a time of contrast. There were good sides and bad sides. And, and now when Putin's propaganda now tries to paint the whole the 90s as so it's very dark, very black, uh, you know, here at this point, this is simply not true. And so let's so not, not fall into the narrative of this. Um, and of course, as, as, as you just uh, as you just mentioned, um, under uh, Boris Yeltsin in the 90s, the world prices of oil, especially in the second half of the 90s, fluctuated between 10 and 15 dollars an hour. I think you can remember that now. In 1998, the year of the uh, economic crisis, there were nine dollars an hour. And it's actually astonishing that in that situation, um, in 1997, we actually marked the first year of real economic growth since the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was small, but it was, it was on the positive side. Astonishing, given everything that was happening. Um, and it was, of course, also in the 1990s when the infrastructure of, of the market economy was built. And by the time Putin came to power, he inherited that just infrastructure which was already in place. I mean, there were banks, there were financial institutions, there was a regulatory regular, regular mechanism, there were some legislative uh, instruments already in place. And then he had oil prices that skyrocketed. You know, in Yeltsin's time, oil was $15 per barrel. In the first uh, years of Putin, they reached 150 it's not difficult to do this in economic growth if this is one. This, this table could have delivered economic growth if it was in that place, in that circumstance. What's actually astonishing is that all of the problems that you just mentioned, and there are many more. I mean, we've had more than a decade of economic stagnation. In Russia, our last year of real economic growth was 2008. Uh, for several years in a row, there is a, a fall every year of real disposable incomes. And, and this is pre uh, Crimea pre sanctions. And you know, these regimes like to sort of use these excuses to explain away the problems and so forth and so forth. Well, it's, it's, it's mainly the mismanagement and the corruption and the bad policies of the Putin regime. And above all, it's the system of nepotism and corruption that these people have done. And if you think about the fact that there were literally tens of billions of US dollars, you know, so sort of oil showers, people call it, that fell. Uh, on the Russian government in those, in those years during the 2000s when oil prices were sky high. And, you know, a lot of this money went into the pockets of Putin's friends and oligarchs and all KGB powers, into his lavish and, and really bad taste powers on the Black Sea, into the Yorks and, and then in the personal riches and everything else. So, um, you know, let's not forget that the current regime in Russia is not just authoritarian, it is also kleptocratic. From the very classical that ancient Greek definition of kleptocracy ruled by thieves. This is exactly what we have. Um, and so to go back to your question about the, the effect of the economic situation, you know, it's sort of accepted wisdom that political changes in Russia will, will happen when there's a, a sort of a, a bad feeling about the economy. You know, there's, you know, the, the, the citizens start opposing the government over uh, the economic downturn. It doesn't have to be necessarily the case. Uh, just one, one small example, which is a pretty important example. Uh, exactly 10 years ago, uh, we saw uh, the largest protests uh, to date against the rule of Vladimir Putin. You can remember the which protest, the all of their protests, and so on. Just after 2011, 2012, um, the Russian economy was booming at the time. It was a sustained period of economic growth. People's incomes were rising. The middle class, uh, the urban middle classes were doing pretty well. And it actually was the urban middle classes who were at the forefront of those protests because those protests were not about money, they're not about incomes, they're not about salaries, they were about human dignity. Uh, as you recall, those protests were spurred by a patently rigged parliamentary election in 2011. And the people who stood on those squares in Moscow, and Spies, but kind of large cities around the country, you know, one of the main slogans of those protests was, We are not cattle. The people who have reached a certain quality and a certain level of, of, of life in economic terms, um, you know, suddenly there's a desire to, to be treated with respect, to be a citizen of your own country, to have a voice in the right of your own country, instead of being a voiceless subject that could be told what to do. And so uh, we may see in the end the combination of economic and political factors when, when change starts happening in Russia, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And one thing we definitely know, and again, this is um, with my historian uh, rather than politician had speaking, the one thing we definitely do know about the world history of Russia is that major, uh, large scale political change in our country usually starts like this. 
when people least expect it. This is the way it was in 1905, this is the way it was in 1970, this is the way it was in 1991 when we began this conversation. Everything happened like this, nobody completely unexpected. Um, and I think the next time we'll see a window of opportunity for political change in Russia uh, is going to come as a surprise to all of us here in this room myself. Yeah. Well, I hope so. Um, you know, um, earlier we, we mentioned, uh, you know, Jahan mentioned your work with John McCain, um, you know, I think true American hero perspective on the left and the right in the U.S. Um, and a longtime advocate for fighting authoritarianism. I think a lot of people never realize the honor that he, before he died, he personally asked you to be one of his pallbearers. Uh, I think a true honor and a representation of what you represent. Uh, much of your work you did with him was related to sanctions related to the Magnitsky Act, but you were very careful to point out that you want to make sure that the sanctions are specifically targeted, not against the general Russian economy, not to affect the average Russian person, but against the oligarchs, against Putin's inner circle. How difficult is it to really shape and enforce sanctions that only target a very small core elite who are already so connected, already have so much money, uh, especially when it's difficult to get all the Europeans with their different perspectives on board. That's precisely the brilliance of the Magnitsky Act, the fact that it is personal. You know, back in the back in the day, previous historical years, sanctions would be targeted at entire nations, right? When Western democracies were unhappy with certain authoritarian regime, what they would do would slap sanctions on the entire country or the entire economy. In effect, double punishing the population of that country that's already suffering as it is under that authoritarian ruler. And on top of that, now there are international sanctions in effect uh, everywhere. Um, this, for example, is what happened in the, in the 70s with the uh, famous Jackson Valley Commandment here in the US that uh, imposed trade sanctions on the Soviet Union uh, because of the Soviet regime's violation of freedom of navigation. Those were general trade sanctions against one country. And this is how it used to be done, right? Many examples of this. The brilliance of the Magnitsky principle when this came around. I mean, so now it sort of looks natural that, that there is this principle. It never existed before. Let's not forget. When it came around uh, about 2010, this bill was first introduced into the uh, American Congress. It absolutely revolutionized the world of sanctions because for the first time, it was proposed that instead of targeting the entire population, in our case, 140 million Russians, sanctions would actually be fine tuned to target specifically the people who deserve to be targeted. Of course, the way the Magnitsky Act works is uh, what it imposed that no general sanctions, no sanctions against the country, no sanctions even against the government of the country. What the Magnitsky Act does was to impose targeted sanctions on individuals who are personally complicit, obviously based on verifiable evidence, and there's a very high standard that sits with law in terms of the standard of proof. Um, those individuals who are personally complicit in acts of human rights abuse or gross acts of corruption. And these individuals will no longer be able to get a visa on assets or use the financial and banking system of the country that passes this legislation, in this case, the United States. Uh, so this is, of course, needless to say, much more just to target the individuals who deserve to be targeted as opposed to starting sanctions on everybody. But as importantly, it is an immensely effective and immensely powerful tool because of the nature of the system, the black man is not in Russia. I already mentioned it's not just an authoritarian regime, but it's also a kleptocratic one. And it's a very globally integrated kleptocracy. The people who are around Putin, the people who are in charge of Russia today, they like to steal in Russia, but then go and stash away that stolen money in the West. Because all their lives are in the West, all their bank accounts, their yachts, their villas, their wives, their mistresses, you name it, everything is in Western country. Where that money is protected by the very same rule of law that they deny our own people. That's an astonishing hypocrisy of the same people who abuse and attack and undermine the most basic rules of civilized society at home, the most basic rules of democracy in the world, like Russia, who want to then come to the West and enjoy the benefits and the fruits and the privileges of the notions of the rule of democracy that they deny uh, But of course, that's only one side of the equation, right? So the other side is. Um, it's been said that sort of famous phrase that the largest export from the Putin regime to the West is not oil or gas, it's corruption. And I think that statement is absolutely true. Except, of course, that is a two way street. And for someone to be able to export corruption, someone else somewhere needs to be willing to import. 
And unfortunately, we have seen no shortage of Western countries, Western governments, Western banks, Western financial institutions, who are also willing to look the other way or actually very actively accept this dirty corrupt money that the group money guys are pumping uh, into, these, uh, into these Western kingdoms, um, which in my view constitutes an aiding and complicity. And so the Magnitsky Act is directed at the same time against the hypocrisy of those corrupt actors and human rights abuses. Abusers who want to steal in Russia and spend in the West. It's also the other side of it is directed against enablers in the West who are profiting of the situation. And so um, and that's that's the brilliance of this mechanism. It's both personal and global at the same time. This was the original Magnitsky Act that I worked on before I stepped on this part of my Simon McCain all those years ago. The original Magnitsky Act was uh, applicable uh, only to officials of Putin's regimes, only to, to Russia. Four years later, in 2016, it was made global. So now there's a global Magnitsky Act in the US that applies the same principle to any person anywhere in the world who's complicit in corruption. So the brilliance of this is that it is both personal in the sense that it targets individuals rather than countries, and it's global in the sense that it's not directed towards any country in particular. In fact, if you look at the list of individuals currently sanctioned by the US Treasury under the global Magnitsky Act, it even includes some citizens of democratic countries. It's not about countries, it's not about individuals too. Um, and one of the biggest problems for the Kremlin uh, also is that it's impossible for them to try to present these sanctions as quote unquote anti Russian, because they don't target the Russian people, they target those who steal from the Russian people. In fact, Boris Nemtsov said that the Magnitsky Act is the most pro Russian law ever passed in a foreign country because it targets the people who abuse the rights of Russian citizens and who steal the money of Russian taxpayers. And that is absolutely true. And, you know, looking at sanctions, obviously, there are a lot in the news now, and hopefully maybe it's a, a threat of things. Sanctions is enough to, uh, you know, bring us back from perhaps a precipice with 100 plus thousand Russian troops surrounding Ukraine on three sides. Um, obviously, you know, Putin's already made it in 2014, occupying Crimea still, and parts of the Donbass. Um, we always hear it from the Western perspective, but in Russia itself, you know, obviously people say closer to what might happen, they might release a fake video of ethnic Russians being attacked or abused in Luhansk or something like that. But in Russia itself, how will or is this being portrayed that in any ways they could justify a major war, even if it's a hybrid war or a massive cyber attack with Ukraine? Is it they're saying we must reclaim that the Russian homeland? Is it that if we don't take Ukraine back, NATO will eventually go into Ukraine and eventually they're going to invade Russia? How, how is it justified to the Russian people? So I'll sort of answer that in two different parts. So the, the first part would be that um, you know, for most uh, Russian citizens, the primary source of news and information remains television. And the first thing that Putin made sure of when he came to power almost decades ago uh, was to shut down, silence uh, independent television networks. You know, when, when he came to power, most of Russia's nationwide TV networks were actually privately owned, I've got to say. Putin ended up within the first three years of his rule. 2003, uh, his government shut down the last privately held independent. Uh, TV channel, you mentioned previously, Hugo Chavez, very many similarities, something in a sense of the consolidation of authoritarian regimes in, in Russia and so on. Um, and, and so today, and for many years now, the television uh, space is completely monopolized by the regime. And so if you watch Russian state television, uh, which I don't advise you to do is not your mental health, but if you do, you will get bombarded day in and day out with the most Violent, hate filled uh, propaganda of the worst sort. And, you know, for those who, who do watch Russian state television, they live in, 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 in a crazy, made up, imaginary world where the Ukraine is a puppet state, state run by the Nazis, where the Ukrainian army crucifies Russian children. This is literally, it's not a big speech. There was a report on that when, when the war in Donbass began where uh, the United States of America has no other golden life except to dismember and defeat and destroy Russia. And you sort of live in this artificial, paranoid creation uh, day after day after day. And so, of course, that, that, that cannot but have an effect uh, on, 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 what, on how people see the world. Having said that, um, I think 
you know, with every authoritarian regime, there comes a time when they take the next step thinking you know, they've taken many of those steps before and they worked, and sadly that one doesn't. Uh, you know, there's this concept of a small victorious war, uh, right, to coin a phrase from the early 20th century Russian history, uh, where many of these regimes feel that, okay, let's distract people, uh, people's attention from domestic problems by starting a war somewhere, you know, that's uh, rally around the flag and all the rest of it. And, but we know that there comes a time where this actually backfires and has the exact opposite effect from the one that was intended. This is actually what happened with the original small victorious war with Japan in 1905. It actually ended up causing a revolution in Russia. And the Tsar was forced to grant the parliament, freedom of the press, and so on. But that was not the intended goal. And of course, something similar happened with the war in Afghanistan for the Soviets in the 1990s, which in many ways helped precipitate the fall of the Soviet regime. And so it's very possible that if Putin does move against uh, Ukraine, this could be one of those steps that actually ends up backfiring on him. It worked for him in Crimea, it worked for him in Georgia. But you know, Crimea, for example, that was that was a unique case. I have to say, and it gives me no pleasure to say this, but just 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 to be honest, even many people in Russia who are uh, sort of like-minded, who so want Russia to be a democratic country, who opposed to Putin and most other things. Even for many of people like that, Crimea struck sort of a certain emotional chord. That it was unjust what happened, it was sort of given to Ukraine within the framework of the Soviet Union, it shouldn't really be Ukraine, and all the rest of it. Um, nothing else can work in this way. Nobody cares about, you know, reclaiming Donetsk or whatever, to use all the to use that stuff. In fact, survey after survey, there's a big caveat about opinion polls in an authoritarian state, needless to say, right? When First of all, that people lack access to general information. Secondly, are hesitant to share the political views of somebody who knows them as well, or calls them up in their, in their home. But even with this caveat, survey after survey after survey uh, from the Nevada Center, for example, which is the last more or less independent uh, foreign agency in Russia, shows that the vast majority of Russian citizens oppose any kind of military action against Ukraine. And so this is why the Kremlin has to be really careful to pretend. But there are no Russian troops in Ukraine, even though some of you know that they're, they're there since 2014. Right? Not just Germany, but also the Donbass. The These so called separatists have really knows that actually many of them are regular Russian troops. But again, if you watch that imaginary propaganda world, uh, they're very careful to pretend that Russian troops have nothing to do with that because even they understand that this would actually backfire in terms of public opinion. Um, but it's a really worrisome situation, as, as you. As you just said uh, the accumulation of troops continues. It's not just now on the Russian Ukrainian war, but also on the Belarus Ukrainian war from the north, potentially opening up another front. And one of the most troubling developments was in the last two weeks when the Communist Party in the Duma, the so called parliamentary opposition, put forward a draft resolution on the official recognition of the so called Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. Uh, as you remember, that was sort of the model. For well, the Georgia War in 2008, when the Duma passed the resolution recognizing Abkhazia and South Ossetia, two breakaway regions. And the fact that it's being done not by Putin's official party, but by the so called opposition party, that's sort of a classic Kremlin manipulative tactic where you try to do something with somebody else's hands. And you say, oh, it's not us, it's you know, the opposition proposal we have to debate it. And all the rest of it. So uh, I think that's, that's a particularly uh, worrisome space to watch when that uh, resolution will be considered. Probably when there's no date, it looks likely to be either late in the slot or at the end of March. And uh, yeah, just one more question. My, my colleagues are collecting a few of those question cards. Uh, people may have seen, um, you know, I think 2020, the Duma uh, changed, amended the Constitution to allow Putin to run, uh, be in office until potentially 2036. Uh, he signed, so not surprised, he signed it into, into law himself, I think, last year. Uh, if he does so, he will have been in power longer than Stalin, which is kind of hard to imagine. Um, uh, how, I just would like you to answer. It's, I, I think it's it's uh, it's a, I think kind of some of a, a crude retort here. Some people say um, some people say much the way they say. Well, in the Middle East, they're not ready yet for democracy. They're 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 not capable of democracy. What do you say to those people? And, and the Kremlin's very happy, probably propagated. But this idea that Russia is such a massive country, it's so much of the land is a very cold, hard place to live, hard place to farm, hard place to survive. You need a strong man. It's a country of 
of dozens of different ethnic groups, of dozens of you know, different uh, languages, um, multiple religions, and that it requires a strong man. How, how do you counter that you know, argument? Uh, well, first of all, on, on Putin's longevity in power, uh, well, let's not forget that we already now, today, have a whole generation in Russia that has grown up not knowing any other political reality. Uh, we have people who were born, went to kindergarten, went to school, went to college, and are now entering their adult professional lives. In all this time, one man has stayed in power. And you in America have had five presidents of two political parties at the same time. Uh, would you say, and this is in itself is mind boggling. Uh, but on the uh, 2036 timeline, um, I have to say, I mean, of course, as we know, when you get this story when you're speaking on a politician, um, I haven't yet met a single person, and that includes not just people in our camp, in the opposition camp, but also people who are in the pro regime camp, who actually believe that Putin will be able to stay in power that long. It's one thing what a dictator wants, and quite another that actually happens in reality. Probably every dictator wants to stay in power for as long as they're physically alive. Thankfully, we know from history that doesn't always happen. Uh, to put it mildly. So uh, I think there will be uh, major political changes in Russia coming long, long before uh, that day that you mentioned. But on the substance of your question, uh, thank you for asking that because uh, you know, that's sort of one of the most tired, one of the oldest, uh, and also one of the most insulting, frankly, stereotypes uh, that sometimes you know, peddled in the West about Russia. You know, oh, you know, these Russians, they come to talk, they don't know how to do it. You need a strong hand, they can all oh, oh, they can. Do is live under authoritarian regimes. And this is a this is a well known view. Um, President Reagan in his uh, Westminster speech in 1982 referred to such a view as cultural condescension or worse. And I quote from the speech. Um, Thomas Henry Gilles, the former president of Estonia, actually called such a view of like racist to suggest that there is a, a certain people, a certain culture, a certain nation that's just not made for democracy. All they can live is uh, is uh, under dictation. Well, because I don't, I don't need to explain uh, why that view is insulting, but I think uh, more importantly, uh, that view is just simply factually incorrect. Because as a historian of education, I prefer to deal with facts rather than myths or stereotypes. If we actually look at facts, uh, we will see that every time uh, that the Russian people actually had an opportunity uh, to freely choose between democracy and dictatorship. They always chose democracy. 1906, the first ever election to the Russian parliament, the State Duma, when um, uh, the leading reform party at the time, the cadets, the constitutional democrats, won an overwhelming majority, and supporters of Tsarist autocracy did not win a single seat, zero. Uh, 1970, November, the election to the uh, All Russian Constituent Assembly that was held after the forceful seizure of power by the Bolsheviks, and the Bolsheviks lost that election to a party that was committed to a democratic republic as opposed to a dictatorship of the proletariat, um, and something that happened within my own lifetime, June 1991, the first ever uh, direct election by the state in the thousand year history of Russia, when the candidate of the pro-democracy forces, Boris Yeltsin, defeated the Communist Party of the Soviet Union by 57% to 17. Again, those are facts, not, those are not stereotypes. And it's been said many times in history about many countries that, you know, that of the other country just comes to democracy. Today, all of those countries, of which this was said, are successful, functioning liberal democracies, and I have absolutely no, no doubt that one day Russia will be one as well. There's no considerable reason that we have no issue. Yeah, absolutely, and thank you for, for dedicating your life to, to get there. Um, uh, I, I know a lot of people probably have a similar question, um, uh, just on a personal level. Uh, Harper asks, uh, do you still have encounters with the Russian government? Uh, you know, how do you, what do you do, or how do you, do you still, still, still have encounters with the Russian government? And I suppose, what do you do is kind of try to keep yourself safe? Well, there's only one precaution I can take, and I did, and that's, uh, that's the fact that my family is outside of Russia. My wife and children are outside of Russia. Many, many of our colleagues have had to take this basic precaution too, but that's the only thing. Um, I mean, other than that, um, what else can we do? Uh, and it's, I guess it's, uh, it's sort of a self-defense mechanism almost of the human mind that you just try not to think about this because otherwise you just go crazy and paranoid and you know walk in fear all the time. Just a human uh, person cannot sustain that. So uh, sure, there are many encounters we you know that we follow, the phones are bugged and all the rest of it. And actually the surveillance is very often um, really crazy. I mean it's, it's it's made so that we can actually see that we're being followed. But and you know it all sort of comes with the with the job and with the territory, there's nothing 
nothing too uh, new enough for us. Um, and just there are uh, three or four questions related to Ukraine. Uh, I'll just, you know, kind of put bits them together. But just uh, more generally, you know, anarchists has asked, do you think the US, Germany, and other countries would eventually send troops perhaps to Ukraine? Uh, you know, it's not part of NATO, but you know, how might they respond? Um, you know, another person asks, is Putin's goal in Europe to stop the expansion of NATO? Uh, and then I suppose another person asks, uh, how do you assess, uh, you know, uh, Biden's approach to, to Russia? So the NATO question is very interesting. Uh, you know, we've just marked a whole series of interesting and important anniversaries, uh, 30 years of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, 30 years just early this month of the official end of the Cold War. We have David Declaration of February 1st, 1992, signed by President Bush Sr. and President Yeltsin. Um, one of those anniversaries actually came right at the end of December, uh, when, I believe this was December 21st, 1991, there was a meeting of the North Atlantic Cooperation Council, as they called it, Brussels, NATO headquarters. This was a group sort of bringing together. Uh, NATO countries and former Warsaw Pact countries. Warsaw Pact had just ceased to exist just a few months earlier. And at that meeting, yeah, I'm pretty sure about that, December 21st, 1991, uh, the Russian ambassador came in and read out a letter uh, signed by President Yeltsin, addressed to Manfred Werner, the Secretary General of NATO, uh, raising the question for the first time, uh, raising the question of future Russian membership in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. I think one of the biggest missed opportunities of the 1990s, or many missed opportunities, of course, domestically in Russia, which I can talk for hours about, but because you raised the question of NATO, one of the biggest missed opportunities on the West's part in the 1990s was that the West was not ready to fully welcome, to fully embrace the nascent democratic Russia at the time. If it had been prepared for that, I think we would be living in a different world today, because let's not forget how much the sort of the post-communist reform process in a lot of Central and Eastern Europe at the time was tied to that prospect of European and Euro-Atlantic integration. Václav Havel, uh, President of Czechoslovakia, later of the Czech Republic, famously said that you know for us this whole process of decommunization means our return to Europe. This was the phrase he used in the speech uh, from the US Congress in 1992. And it was very important for all the economic hardships that those countries also experienced in the 90s, that they had that prospect and they had that to look forward to, and that served as a really powerful impetus for the reform process that we know in the end succeeded. We in Russia never had that in the 90s. Russia was sort of kept at the doorstep of that process, and it was a great mistake by the West, I think, in the 90s. And that's a mistake uh, that is very important that it is not repeated the next time there's a window of opportunity for change in Russia because it will come. And it's, to me, I mean, I'm a historian, so obviously I enjoy just talking about history in general, but to me, history has a very practical side, is that it offers very important lessons for the future, and it's really important for the West not to repeat that mistake and to be ready to welcome that future post-Putin democratic Russia as a full member of the euro atlantic community. That's very important to speak about it now, while this is still ahead of us, because generally when things start happening, it's too late to... Uh, uh, to sort of uh, to try and do something about this. Uh, and uh, remind me of the last question. And I, it was just, I mean, I suppose, you know, overall, with regards to, you know, Ukraine, uh, where do you see things going? Do you think, after Jimmy asked that question, uh, why is the threat to shut down you know, Nord Stream 2 to, to stop, you know, uh, more uh, cheaper, you know, natural gas mm -hmm. going from Russia to, to Germany? Enough? What, what will be enough to hopefully maybe, uh, you know, bring us back? From war. But the key here actually is something that we already uh, touched upon, and that is uh, that's the personal sanctions. You know, we talked about the fact that there is a Magnitsky Act in the US, there are actually similar laws now in almost every major Western jurisdiction Canada, the UK, the European Union, uh, Australia, just before the new year, joined in passing the same legislation. But the problem is that it's not enough to have this legislative mechanism, it actually has to be used. The governments must be prepared to use it. Um, and the the actual practical implementation uh, of this personal sanctions mechanism has been nowhere near where it should be. And uh, now, you know, as, as a lot of people are talking about a threat of potentially real war uh, in Europe between Russia and Ukraine, finally we're hearing uh, talk about uh, targeted sanctions being uh, imposed at, at a proper level. So we've heard the US president, we've heard the British Foreign Secretary, and other 
top Western officials, actually speak about potentially targeting Putin himself and his own money and those oligarchs, Kremlin wallets, as we're called them, because they keep Putin's money, right? He's too clever to keep that as a name. He's usually trusted individuals. And most of them are still not under any kind of Western sanctions. So when we hear finally talk about these targeted sanctions rising to the level of the cost of sabotage about Putin, this could be potentially the most effective and the most important. Because these people who are sitting in the program today don't care about Russia, but they do care about their own pockets and their own wallets. So that's the other thing that we want. And I'll just do uh, two more of these questions for the sake of time. Um, we need to kind of you know, get towards uh, kind of wrapping things up. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I was having a, a question from a high school student. Um, uh, Solomé asks, um, how does the education and perception shape the future of Russian political discourse, you know, for students, especially the young ones of Russia today? Um, so, uh, as we know, very often uh, dictatorial regimes uh, like to control not just the future, but the past. Uh, and so one of the biggest areas of focus for Putin is to try to, um, for example, completely reshape the teaching of history. Uh, in Russia, both at the school level and the university level, and, to, and we have seen a concerted effort over these past years that has been in power, decades, to whitewash the Soviet past, to glorify the Soviet past, to try to sort of underplay the horrendous state-sponsored repression that happened in the Soviet Union, and to pretend that, you know, yeah, maybe there were some mistakes, but generally it was greed and blah, blah, blah. Uh, we see this, we see attempts to control educational institutions, uh, universities in particular, uh, you know, we see repressions against people uh, in the education system who dare to have independent opinion speak their mind. And it was just literally this past week there was a, a story that broke out in, in St. Petersburg where a school teacher was, was forced to resign because she uh, she wanted to, to teach kids uh, poetry uh, from the uh, new Khans, who was uh, Alexander Vigensky, who was the poets from the, the 1930s who both repressed and decided. Mm -hmm. um, and the school principal's actor, who was saying that these are enemies of the people, we cannot teach them. Well, this, this is in 2022, this is happening. And so there's no, almost no area of life in Russia that's you know, touched uh, by what Putin is doing. And, and unfortunately, uh, education is a big part of that. And also, let's not forget sort of another angle to this. Uh, when we talk about the way elections are doctored and the vote count of elections is sort of corrected to, to uh, reflect what the Kremlin wants, in the vast majority of cases, the members of the local electoral precincts are actually school teachers because usually, and I guess it's actually probably the same in the US, a lot of times schools serve as the polling stations. And so you have teachers who have school serving the local electoral commission county votes. And so you have, in a way, the system where, well, I guess probably millions or at least hundreds of thousands of teachers in Russia have been directly involved uh, in this state driven attempt. To, uh, to to enact election fraud and to, to doctor manipulate and rig election results. And of course, that has been obviously corrupting, not in a financial, but in just a human and political uh, sense effect uh, on, on this massive part of the education system as well. Um, and for our last question, I just never heard to uh, let you guys know what also is coming up. For any of you are interested in, in, in Eastern Europe and really where we are with Ukraine and Russia beyond, uh, again, uh, in about two weeks, February 23rd, we're hosting an excellent program, uh, The View from Eastern Europe, with uh, the four uh, visiting, uh, well, they're, they're all in Washington, D.C., but they'll be visiting these four uh, Eastern European ambassadors to the United States, or ambassadors of Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, and Slovakia, uh, called the Visegrad Group, V4. Uh, I always think it's interesting to get perspectives from those countries themselves. Um, obviously, those who are closer to Ukraine and closer to Germany, um, so to, to, to Russia, um, a lot uh, on their minds. And uh, a little bit later in March, uh, we'll be hosting another event on Ukraine and the United States, uh, in particular, our options with uh, former U.S. Ambassador William Taylor. A lot of you may remember him. He uh, was the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine under both uh, George W. Bush and also uh, for, for part of Obama's administration, and then came back as the charge to fair the acting ambassador, as a permanent ambassador, was a good place uh, during part of the Trump administration. And I remember him in the last few years from some of the, you know, uh, I suppose really kind of um, kind of really, and I suppose powerful congressional testimony that he's given over the last few years with regards to the United States and Ukraine. So, uh, uh, William Taylor, there's probably no American diplomat more experienced and more understanding of Ukraine. 
uh, so that'll be on March 24th. Um, I just try to end things on, on, on a brighter note. Um, uh, Andrew asked a, a, you know, a nice question, says this seems to be a, a dark moment uh, uh, for Russia. Um, what are the bright spots, if any, that the West might not know? And, and just lastly, anything you'd like to leave the audience with regards to Russia and, and your outlook? Thank you for that question. And in fact, I mean, the reason uh, everything is, seems so dark is because most of this conversation will focus on the official side, on what Putin is doing, what the regime is doing, what repressive policies are in place. Uh, let's not forget that Russia and the Putin regime are not one and the same. That's a distinction we always ask people in the West to make. Don't equate a nation, a great nation, with an authoritarian clique that this rules and those are different things. And so, uh, it, you know, despite uh, everything that we've talked about in terms of oppressions and the abuses and everything that the Putin system represents. There are millions of people in Russia, mostly young people, who have a very different vision of the future of our country, who are fed up with this unchanging, uh, aging dictator who's been there now for the third decade and who wants to stay for however else uh, more, who just consider it completely anachronistic, if, if nothing else, to have a European country in the 21st century be ruled by an autocrat from the former Soviet Union. Uh, and I, I meet these people very often as they go around the country. I'm, not, I'm, in, I'm in Moscow, I live in Moscow, but I travel widely in, in the regions as well, we're the largest country in the world, like time zones. Um, and I would say the biggest source of hope and optimism to me uh, is speaking with the younger generation. Ironically, that same generation that has no other memories except who tries right? so you could sort of, somebody could assume that this would be the brainwashed generation, but in fact, we see the exact opposite. Uh, and those young people are really leading uh, that movement for change. And when these mass nationwide protests happened uh, last year, a year ago, after the arrest of uh, Alexei Navalny in January 2021, tens of thousands of people on the streets, literally from the Baltic Sea to the Pacific Ocean. The vast majority of those protesters were young people. In fact, there was some service conducted on the, the SNAP, uh, the SNAP survey, especially in the biggest cities, Moscow and Petersburg, and the, the median age of the protesters. Uh, it was about 24. Mr. Putin's only 70 this year. You know, they are the future of Russia. He was, uh, and what's also really important is that, you know, back in the, back in sort of previous times, you would always be able to tell the difference. Maybe it's Moscow, it's not really speaking maybe, but you would always be able to tell the difference between an audience in the two capital cities, so Moscow and St. Petersburg, and what, you know, people would sort of condescendingly call the provincial audience, right? People out in the provinces. Just by the way people would speak, by the questions they would ask, by the topics they would raise. And so on. That is still true of the older generation. But I have to say that when, you know, when I go around the country and speak to young people, I was in, recently I was in Sydney, which is the, uh, in the northern part, or east, northeastern part of the European Russia, just west of the Euro Mountains, uh, so you know, 400,000 people. Uh, we had a film screening and had a discussion afterwards, and there were several young people, students in the audience. And as I was speaking to them, I sort of caught myself thinking, and I'm no longer able to tell the difference. Uh, whether I'm speaking to somebody in Sitchikar or Moscow, that matter in Prague or Budapest. Because it's a generation that lives in a totally different information space. And it's not that they don't trust Putin TV, they don't watch it, they do these things, right? They live on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. And, and it's a total new reality. Um, and so this you know, long term I have absolutely no doubt that things will work out okay, that Russia will be a normal democratic country. Uh, and that young generation is the biggest source of hope. And it's interesting that you mentioned the word, the word dark, uh, the gentleman's question. Um, it is very dark in Russia today, in terms of everything that we really want, no question about it. Um, and, and there's a very striking historical parallel that I hear increasingly from people uh, with what's happening in Russia today. And that parallel is with the early 1980s. You know, I'll, technically, I was around when I was here. I don't remember that time. Uh, but as a historian, I can appreciate it. Well, we lived through that time as adults, are making it uh, increasingly often. The early 80s was a really dark time. So, Dropoff came to power, the long time KGB had, who epitomized this, this state driven repression and also the external aggression on the side. Um, you had the complete destruction and crushing of the dissident movement. Uh, the Moscow Helsinki group was disbanded at the Chronicle of Current Events, which was the main Samizdat publication, uh, was when I had to cease uh, publications. Leading dissidents uh, in the Soviet Union were, were either in prison, in a labor camp, or in exile. Um, and everything 
seeing you know, all whole things we lost. Really, really dark time again to use that expression. And it was then that you know what remained of the Soviet dissident movement coined a famous phrase that night is darkest before the dawn. And people would laugh at that. They would say, What are you talking about? Things are getting worse and worse. What are you talking about? And you know what? Amazingly, it turned out to be true. And just a few years after that, everything collapsed. And we know what happened since then. It's a really dark time in Russia. But we know, uh, and we've lived through that already, we know that night is darkest before the dawn. And I have absolutely no doubt that uh, the day will come when, to use the words of Alexei Navalny in recent interview, Russia becomes a normal European country. This is the goal for all of us in the opposition movement. And absolutely no doubt that day will be upon us. And everything that my colleagues and I are doing today has as its goal to try to bring that title just a little closer. Yeah, I just want to thank all of you who are here in person, all of you joining virtually. And I want to thank you, Matthew, for your incredible courage, your incredible dedication, um, basically dedicating your entire life since you were a teenager to fight for a, a free, open, and democratic Russia. And, and hopefully, we don't know exactly when or exactly how, but it, it, does, it does come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.